evening, everyone. My name is Uday Bhaskar. Before I formally sort of set the ball rolling for the evening, can I request all of you to put your phones in silent? And those of you who have been here before know that we normally like to start at seven sharp. But before we do that, if you could just put your phones in silent, that would be appropriate. There are lots of places up front if any of you want to come by, you know. And the feeling that, you know, if you leave from somewhere at the back, you will not be noticed is actually a misnomer. So I just thought, <laughs> but you can sit wherever you want, as I said. We will finish a little after eight for those of you who have to pick up your dinner appointments. So. Okay, we are at 1900, so if it's okay by the house, we'll just shut that door. Or the other one. I'm sorry, I'm a sniveling kind of evening for me this evening. Good evening, everyone. As I said, I'm Uday Bhaskar, and allow me to welcome all of you on behalf of the Habitat Center and the Society for Policy Studies. This is a regular public lecture series that we have been um, sort of supporting for the last three years and plus. And today we have a very interesting subject, if you, you know, those of you who got the invite and saw the detail that we said. It's not often that we do a subject like this, which is related to trade and trade architecture, particularly in Asia and the relevance for India. Because those of you who are specialists, and I see many people here, I would like to acknowledge many of our senior practitioners, particularly people like Ambassador Bhatia, you know, who's been head of the WTO negotiations for India, and those of you who represent professional bodies, you know, RIS, ICRIA, et cetera. And also, I'm very gratified that we have a fair sprinkling of students, you know, who are here this evening. I'm sure you know the guideline that we recommend for students, and students is anyone who has not submitted a PhD thesis. So in case you have a doubt who qualifies for student, we encourage you to write about 500 to 800 words once the lecture is over and mail it to one of us in the SPS or the Habitat. And if you're very brave, the last part of your report can be why you disagree with the speaker. You know, I'm sure that will be an interesting proposition, so you can take that. But more seriously, I'm very glad to invite all of you and particularly our speaker and our chair for this evening. I'm sure those of you who are here are aware. You know, let me introduce our chair first, Dr. Shankar Acharya, Professor Shankar Acharya. He is a well-known leading uh, economist, policy economist of India. And he has many feathers to his cap. And what I will do is to flag, you know, the way I've known Shankar over the years. For those of you who are not aware, he has a rare pedigree, you know, which is that he did his undergrad in Oxford and did his PhD in Harvard. And subsequently, he served as the longest serving chief economic advisor in the government of India. He was there from... <laughs> <coughs> that, by the way, is a characteristic of his. Huh? He's very modest about whatever he's done. But this is rare. You know, when we talk about India and the economic reforms, Prime Minister Narasimha Rao and Dr. Manmohan Singh, it was possible because of what I would call as a very strong team, a team of professionals. And among the professionals, there are many, but the very fact that he was there as the chief economic advisor for three governments. 93 to 2001, you will remember, was from Prime Minister Rao, subsequently all the way till Prime Minister Vajpayee. And this was a particularly turbulent period, I would say, for India in more ways than one. And as I said, he was there holding the fort, as it were. Subsequently, he's also held a number of, I would say, very important and uh, positions that he was nominated to, including he was professor at ICRIA, where he still is, and he was also a member of various banks, Kotak Mahindra, one of our most successful private banks. 
And when we met, you know, we were in the IIC, you know, in a certain group that was trying to do something in the IIC. And as I said, I've always remained very, very, I would say, humbled by his, not only his water table, but the fact that he wears his accomplishments so lightly. Sir, thank you very much for being the chair this evening. He's also spoken under our banner, so we are very glad that he's back as the chair for this evening. And our speaker for this evening is Professor Amita Batra. She is currently at the JNU, Center for South Asian Studies. And again, those of you who are either following this subject or you know, are, shall we say, keeping abreast of the current literature, both in journals and in newspapers, the reason why I made this request to Amita and actually shanghaied her, I did not give her an option and insisted that she must speak. Over the last few months, she's written a series of very, very, I would say, lucid and insightful articles in the business standard. And if you, those of you who have read it, I think she has actually drawn attention to some very important developments as far as the trade architecture in Asia, particularly post-Trump, post-TPP, and what is happening in Asia and what are the implications as far as India is concerned. She has written on RCEP, she has written on TPP, and you know, post-TPP. So I thought that you know, when we were looking at speakers and subjects, at very short notice, I made this request to her, and I would say very graciously, she agreed to share her thoughts. She also has been a consultant, and she has held a number of positions. And ma'am, may I invite you on behalf of the Habitat and the SPS, and again, thank you for accepting our invitation. What I will do is to hand over to Professor Acharya. Please, sir, you, you go first, and you know it's all yours. I'll sit there. Hmm? All yours. Yeah. I'll sit in front here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Commander Bhaskar. It's always been a pleasure for me to be associated with anything you do. And I know you have a wide range of accomplishments, which we won't go into today, perhaps, including in the art world. <laughs> um, First, I want to also thank all of you who've come, taken the trouble to come. Delhi is a place where commuting is getting harder and harder. And going from A to B, usually an average of at least 50 minutes each way. So it's a, I think any, anybody has to acknowledge that you have made the effort. So uh, I'm building this up for Professor Bartra to meet your expectations. So it's making life far hard for her. And I'm, as uh, uh, Commander Bhaskar said, that uh, you know it's particularly nice that younger people have also come. But uh, I don't want to leave it only at younger people. There's one um, perhaps unknown but very important gentleman here today, unknown to many of you, uh, who was mentioned by Uday. That is uh, Ambassador Bhatia, who's sitting, the only person aside from yourself who's brave enough to sit in the front row. Uh, he not only uh, headed the important um, division, trade policy division, as it was called, I think, in commerce, uh, to conduct many of our trade negotiations quite a few years ago now. But uh, right now, uh, after his government service, right now for the last three years, is it? Seven. seven years, I beg your pardon. For the last seven years, he's been associated with the appellate body of the WTO, uh, and in the recent years as its chairperson. And this is a body which is absolutely at the heart, as I understand it, please correct me, at the heart of making WTO work. Because the importance of WTO is that peop uh, countries can appeal <coughs> against other countries' trade policies. We've had appeals against our trade policies and vice versa. And when there is such an appeal, it has to go to an appellate body, and he chairs that appellate body. And that body is now under extremely strong threat, I'm afraid, as he knows better than any of us, because ever since uh, the change in the presidency of the United States, Mr. Trump, uh, they have blocked all further appointments of judges. I think there are seven normally. Each time somebody now retires, the vacancy remains a vacancy. And I believe you're now down to three. And so it's a matter of time before the body may cease to exist under current. And if that happens, it is a very serious matter because it's at the engine room of the WTO in making the multilateral trade system work. So thank you very kindly for coming. Um, 
And with that, uh, I should also say that uh, uh, from my knowledge of Professor Batra's earlier work, let me just say that uh, I regard her as uh, one of the finest trade economists working in India today. And uh, I got to know her during her five years in uh, ICRIA in the previous decade, before the, pre the last 10 years that I believe you were at JNU. And she's, of course, held other jobs as, or, or positions, including, I think, a visiting professor at Edinburgh, um, visiting uh, a senior fellow at um, Sydney, University of Sydney, and done <coughs> produced some wonderful books on regional economic integration, which some of you, particularly the younger people, perhaps, have undoubtedly read. So with that, turn it over to the substantive part. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Acharya, uh, for those very kind words. Thank you, Commodore Bhaskar, uh, for inviting me today to come and speak on uh, the evolving trade architecture in Asia and bring out the relevance of this subject for India. Uh, I try and break up my uh, argument. I mean, I'm going to take you back uh, two decades. I'm not necessarily going to focus just on what's happening now, but build up to the present. Uh, taking you back two decades with phases and break dates as far, uh, as far as trade evolution is concerned. I look at trade as it has evolved globally and bring out the importance of what has really led trade in the world, in the sense global trade flows that have been led by uh, global value chains. I bring up the linkages between global value chains and global trade flows. And within that, I try and place the Asian participation in both trade individually and how the GVC-led trade has really at its center the Asian participation that has taken it forward. Uh, how changes in trade are a reflection of East Asia, in particular the rise of China in this, the rise of China as the hub or the central hub of factory Asia and the GVC evolution. We take the GVC evolution right to the present to see how in the present context we can have the mega regional trade agreements in Asia push forward the idea of global value chains. And then I bring to you the relevance of all this development, all these developments for India. I also, while I move across in terms of trade trends, bring out the, or highlight the rise of China. In some places, I'll also be comparing the presence or the relative importance as far as India is concerned. Uh, global trade trends, as I said, I take you back 20 years. There have been significant shifts in the structure and pattern since the beginning of 2000s. And we've seen from 2002 to 2011 a threefold increase in these global trade flows from a 6.5 trillion US dollar in 2002 to 18 trillion dollars in 2011. And this trade growth turned sluggish in 2012 onwards, dramatically negative in 2015. Uh, saw a certain amount of recovery in 2016 and back to path of recovery in 2017. In 2018, what we see is a lot of protectionist measures that have come into, uh, come into existence, a lot of trade tensions that have got translated into protectionist measures. But before that, in the sense when we are talking about recovery, we do say that as far as 2017 is concerned, the global trade did record its highest growth rate in volume and value terms in six years since 2011 in 2017 for the first time. And merchandise trade volume grew by 4.7%, which was the first annual increase, which was greater than 3% since 2011. So two 2017 has really seen a significant turnaround in global trade to say, for us to say that yes, it's back on the path of recovery. Alternatively, if you look at this uh, global trade scenario, we can see in terms of trade to GDP ratio, how trade has been moving relative to growth in income. That's what we call as the elasticity with respect to income. The historical ratio 80s to 90s, mid 90s has been 1.5. This was greater than 2.2 in the 1990s, specifically in the late 1990s. But it fell back to one in the sense of trade increasing at almost the same rate as the increase in GDP between 2011 and 2016, rebounding from a low of 0.8 in 2016 to 1.5 in 2017. And in 2018, the trend of recovery, as I said earlier, continues despite trade tensions between the two major economies, two major trading economies, if I may say so, 
And these trade tensions having translated into a rise in protectionist measures around the world. As of 2011, in this, what we see is how the trade was distributed across the world. There's increase, as I said, in this world trade, 2002-2011, largely driven by rise in trade between developing countries, what we also call as South-South trade. And as of 2011, almost half of the world trade originated from developing countries. It was almost an equal share that we saw between developed and developing countries. Uh, developed countries contributing about $9 trillion of exports, 10 as far as imports are concerned. Similarly, were, was the uh, contribution in terms of the developing countries. And their share in terms of 50% contribution to global trade flows was up from a third in 2002. So a significant rise in the presence of developing countries contributing to global trade flows in the period when trade was rising across the world. Trade then was largely concentrated in three major hubs around the world, Europe, North America, and East Asia. And East Asia was dominating the developing country trade flows with an estimated 4 trillion US dollars of exports and imports in 2011. So a significant presence that we see in this rise in developing countries in overall trade flows, increasing trade, fo trade flows, so to say, and trade among East Asian countries. That is here we see both trade with East Asia increasing as well as trade among the East Asian countries increasing. And this was the highest regional share with other regions contributing a much smaller share in total trade. Trade among the East Asian countries was 13% of world trade, the largest, as I said. Within the East Asian context, there is the rising importance of China. East Asia, as I said, an increasingly important partner for all other developing country regions. This was particularly so since 2006. Substantial trade that also existed between US, Europe, and East Asia. And this trade that existed between U US, Europe, and East Asia was largely trade with China. Of note here, the important thing that we must note here is the fact that when we are talking about regions, there's a lot of trade that happened at this time between 2002 to 2011 that was intra-regional trade. And as I said, East Asia contributed the maximum share in this, but as far as the largest contributory country within this is concerned, that is China is concerned, it is an outlier in the East Asian region in the sense that its share of intra-regional trade was the lowest in the region and declining. This is largely owing to China's increased trade with developed countries. China had a greater share, increasing rate of growth of China's trade with countries outside the world. 2002 to 11, and we emphasize this further, all emerging markets, as I said earlier, all developing countries gained in terms of greater contribution to trade. All emerging markets gained a larger share of world trade, but China experienced the greatest gains in the emerging market economy uh, context, and its market share in world trade rose by around 5% since 2002. It's become an increasingly important, during this time, an increasingly important trading partner for virtually all countries of the world. India, too, gained in share, its sh in share as far as world trade is concerned, that increased by around 1%. With increased gains of 1%, that is significant proportion of this 1% coming about only in the latter half of the decade from 2002 to 2011. So much smaller gains coming up much later. The composition of this trade flow, that is what we've seen as increasing flows across the world in 2011, it was really the intermediate goods that accounted for about 40% of the total trade. At 7 trillion US dollars, they contributed 40% of the total trade, and therefore they were the most important flow in world trade. The high value of this intermediate products is indicative of how Intermediate products were crossing borders in order to constitute what we call as the global value chain or regional value chain led trade. Trade was being led by production fragmentation across countries and this production fragmentation was leading the increased rate of growth of trade. Almost all of this relates to trade of developed countries and to the East Asian region. That is the only context as far as developing country context is concerned in terms of an increase in intermediate trade is the East Asian region that contributes to this. A substantial trade, that is a substantial amount of this intermediate trade 
is intra-regional, and a lot of this is happening within the East Asian region. The East Asian region's export composition, as I said earlier, is uh, reflective of how it came up to be the global manufacturing hub. It had a relatively high imports of primary and intermediate products, which was matched by relatively high exports of intermediate, final, and capital products. East Asia at this time accounted for about 70% of the global value of export of office machinery. I'll come to this later in the sense of how this has been reflected in terms of the, one of the most dynamic sectors in intermediate uh, goods trade across the world. Communication equipment and about 50% of exports of tanning, textiles, and apparel products. All of these being categories which were the more dynamic sectors in this period of rise of global trade. The value of trade of other developing country regions is substantially smaller at this time, and they were particularly concentrated <coughs> in exports of primary goods and imports of intermediate and final products. Imports of intermediate and final products indicating to a certain extent their participation in uh, global value chains and regional value chains, but only to the extent of being linked in terms of backward linkages, not supplying intermediate goods for exports of other countries. This, as I said earlier, was not true of China, which is doing both. Uh, when we look at the sector-wise dynamism, as I said earlier, uh, we look at the production fragmentation and we see that as components or as segments of the overall production of individual firms started to get located across borders, the maximum relocation occurred in sectors like office machinery, communication equipment, textiles, and apparel. I color office machinery here in green and textiles in orange because these two undergo a reversal both in terms of their share in total exports as well as their share in total intermediate goods exports, indicative of the relative importance that one gains in terms of greater share in exports and greater share in terms of global value chain constitution and global value chain growth and how the other reduces in terms of its importance as far as contribution to trade growth as well as trade value chains is concerned. Office machinery is the most dynamic sector with almost 40% of exports in this sector getting relocated across the world. Basically computers that we talk about. Uh, China, and in this, if you look at the share in terms of the most dynamic sector and how do we see the most dynamic economy in increasing its share here, we see China gained export market share in almost all the dynamic sectors. As I said uh, earlier, these are the sectors in which China sees its exports rise. In office machinery, which is the most dynamic sector, China gains 17%, and this is largely at the cost of US and Japan losing their shares in this category. Communication equipment saw similar trends, although of much lower magnitude. Apparel, China gains between 2006 and 11, but the gains were smaller relative to the other two sectors. And more uh, in terms of share gains are also seen as far as Bangladesh and Vietnam are concerned. They increase in terms of noticeable advantages that come to these two countries in this period. Textile sector has China, Bangladesh, India, and Vietnam increasing their market share. I'll come to this later in the sense of how Bangladesh and Vietnam have probably had greater gains over time relative to India. Developed and East Asian countries exhibited the largest values also of what we call as the intra-industry trade index. How much of trade really is happening in terms of across the borders, break up in terms of production fragmentation across borders. The intra-industry trade is trade within the same industry for the same product intermediates crossing borders. And this indicates not just the extent of participation of a country as far as value chains are concerned, but it also indicates the extent of specialization and increased efficiency that a country acquires in the production of a certain commodity. What we see in this is the relative importance of intra-industry trade in the profile of the East Asian economy that is the highest. So these are the economies that are really experiencing one of the greatest, some of the greatest gains as far as intra-industry trade is concerned. Lower re relocation rates are found in product categories like chemicals, 
paper products, precision instruments, motor vehicles, tanning, as well as food, animal, and vegetable products. If we look at the breakup of India's export sectors, many of these low relocation uh, sectors will actually see appear, we will actually see them appear in terms of some of the major sectors of exports for India. So till 2011, just to give you a recap in the sense of what we have seen so far, is that as far as trade flows are concerned, these have increased at a dramatic rate till 2011. The rising share of developing countries in world trade during this time. Within the developing countries, it was really East Asia that was predominantly gaining in terms of trade. A lot of East Asia trade happened in terms of intra-regional trade. China remains as an outlier in this because China is trading both within as well as outside, probably to a greater extent outside than within the region. Product-wise, if you look at the composition, intermediate goods indicative of supply chain trade development is dominating world trade flows at this time. Office machinery and communication equipment are the lead dynamic sectors where we've seen the lead economy, China, having experienced maximum gains. East Asia trade patterns reflects its role as a global manufacturing hub, as I said, in terms of participation in global value chains, trade as far as intermediate goods are concerned, as well as in terms of the value of the intra-industry trade index. Facilitating factors in all of this, of course, have been the information communication technology revolution that facilitated the movement of goods across borders, lower cost, lower transaction costs, on account of both advantages that were seen in terms of transport as well as communication. China's accession to the WTO that led to an increased amount of liberalization as far as the Chinese economy was concerned. Uh, its FDI strategy that brought in firms within China and with it technology and with it increased possibilities of participation as far as China was concerned in global value chains and the rise of factory Asia in terms of how the other smaller economies of the East Asian region started to participate by specializing in office machinery equipment and communications equipment in terms of what we broadly call many a times as electronic and electrical goods sector in another classification. 2012 and after, as I said, has seen a trade slowdown. Why? Some of the reasons that we have here, which in a way bring us to where we are today, is that to some extent the post-global financial crisis declining demand from advanced economies has lingered on. Uh, the advanced economies have taken their own time to come back to the path of recovery, and the recovery, when it has come, has been low, slow, and yet to come back to its pre-GFC levels. This low demand responsible, earlier this was the major markets for many economies, now this low demand is responsible to a very large extent to the extent of low trade, slower trade, and the slow pace of growth of trade that we register across the world. But there are other more significant changes and that are probably more permanent changes that have brought about a change and a slowdown in the global growth rate, sorry, global trade growth which is in terms of the changing patterns as far as emerging market economies are concerned. There is an increasing amount of tendency as far as developing countries and emerging markets are concerned in terms of their consuming more of what they are producing. They are exporting much less. A large amount of demand is emerging from within for these emerging market economies. What we see is that the emerging market economies today share of global consumption has risen by roughly 50% over the last decade. Many of these changes, if I may say so, which are apparent post-2012 in terms of being reflected in the slow rate of growth of trade actually started to, uh, you know, they began with during the time that the global financial crisis really happened, 2008-9. We see the reflection of these much later in the sense of a lag, which is 2012 onwards. And what we see as far as the major economy in the world is concerned, major developing or major emerging market economy, China, alone is, you know, the consumption in China is up from 4% of world's consumption in 2007 to 10% just a decade later. So there's been a significant increase in what the developing countries are consuming themselves, and therefore that's also reflected in how fewer goods are crossing borders fewer demand or much less demand that's arising from countries, particularly as far as the traditional markets of many of these economies were concerned, the advanced economies, 
they are able to suffice or they're able to provide the demand from within. Much of this also has to do with rising incomes within these countries. The structural transformation of the Chinese and East Asian economies, which is the other <coughs> major factor that's responsible for the slowdown in the trade growth, that is more and more of these economies, as I said earlier, they're getting oriented towards domestic consumption. At the same time, there is a change in the manner in which they are participating in the global value chains. And this is combined with the other significant change that's happening around the world, which is in terms of a structural transformation that the global value chains are themselves undergoing. So it's a two-way process that's on in the world today, which is that the global value chains are changing in character and the manner in which many emerging market economies are participating in these global value chains is also undergoing a change. The two together are making or are contributing to a much slower rate of growth in world trade. As far as the last, that is the GVC restructuring is concerned, if you look at this, a lot of the movement of the multinational corporations earlier happened in response to what we call as wage arbitrage which is really in terms or in simpler terms, which is basically to say that many developing countries or many uh, in particular largely populated Chinese economy, for example, had large surpluses of labor which could be employed at lower wages. Many multinational corporations saw advantages in moving across borders and taking advantage of this lower cost. Moving across borders was easier because of the ICT revolution, as I said. China was easier to access because of its accession to the WTO. Labor was available at cheaper rates. All in all, this provided means to lower their costs of production because of which it helped to split the production processes across borders. That really led to the intermediate goods trade in the earlier period. Now that has changed. With China's development, with rising wages, with changes in character as far as the labor force in China is concerned, the wage arbitrage in terms of differential is falling. And this has encouraged a new form of relocation of industries across borders. Less than 20% of the goods trade is based on labor cost arbitrage and in many GVCs, that is in many global value chains, this component of trade in response to uh, trade, uh, wage arbitrage is on the decline further on. Global value chains are also becoming, that is while they become less responsive to labor and labor costs as such, this is also a consequence. This is one, a consequence of the fact that there are rising incomes and greater consciousness, consciousness to ask for better wages in many of the developing countries. But this is also a response to the fact that they are becoming less or they're becoming more and more knowledge intensive. That is, as far as the global value chains today are concerned, they've evolved to an extent where the intangible now constitutes a greater proportion of the total value addition in these value chains or in the commodity production. So that global value chains as we see today are less trade intensive, more knowledge intensive, and reliant on really high skill labor. Labor that is well versed with the knowledge component that goes into these kinds of intangible, intensive global value chains. These are reshaped, getting more and more reshaped, as I said, by cross-border data flows. That's become the important component, new technologies, including digital platforms, the internet of things, as we say, automation, which is replacing labor as it is becoming more and more expensive, and artificial intelligence. These are the components that are on the rise and that are coming to constitute the newer forms of evolved global value chains as we see them across the world. And this technological advancement is, as I said earlier, dampening the goods trade while boosting trade in services, particularly those services and tasks that are associated with the, uh, with the components that are knowledge intensive, digital platforms. So these services that may be associated with this will see a rise in terms of their uh, contribution to the value addition, but goods trade in as such is going to see a much lower contribution to overall trade. As far as the services component is concerned, particularly in terms of digitized services, we see that much less reflected as it moves across borders. A lot of things today are done on email. A lot of things that today are done on online, you know. These are far less reflected in trade statistics than what we saw in the earlier phase in terms of movement of intermediate goods abroad. So that what you have is trade reflection, 
uh, to a certain extent, if I may say so, may not necessarily mean that this is going to be uh, much less movement of components of these value chains across border, but these are not goods that are moving across borders. Across all value chains, what we see is investment, as I said, in intangible assets such as the R&D, branding, and intellectual property. These become the important components of the global value chains. This is more than doubled as a share of revenue that is off the total global value chains from 5.5 to 13.1% since 2000. So we've seen this kind of rise gradually to what it is more than double today. Goods producing value chains, particularly those that uh, specialize in automotive as well as computers and electronics as we said earlier, are also at the same time becoming more and more regionally concentrated, especially within Asia and Europe. That is, those that continue to be intermediate goods intensive are increasingly drawing intermediate goods from within the same regions, so that across regions trade is much lower. Emerging market economies are building more and more comprehensive domestic supply chains, reducing their reliance on imported intermediate goods. There is a greater consolidation of the value chain within countries that's happening and that's trending today across the world. Goods producing value chains, they become therefore <coughs> less trade intensive. Between 2007 and 2017, the exports declined from 28.1 to 22.5% of gross output in goods producing value chain. The other part that we see, that is China's restructuring, which has also contributed, as I said, which is the other major factor that's contributing to a slowing down of the growth rate of world trade, is that China is shifting away from export-driven and investment-driven growth model towards consumption and services. Increased domestic consumption within, as I said earlier, which is contributing to increased global domestic consumption, the maximum coming from China itself. Rising wages and factor costs are encouraging value chains growing more and more local technological routes. This is also taking root in China. The GVC trade participation, if you look at China as such, these are two proxies or two indicators that we have of uh, indicating the extent of participation as far as China is concerned in value chain. One, where we see uh, the ratio of China's intermediate goods imports to its manufactured exports, a crude proxy of how much intermediate goods or how much value chain participation does China have? This has fallen from 63% to about 38% between 2000 and 2015. So there has been a huge fall as far as China's participation in terms of intermediate goods imports as contributing to its manufacture of its own exports is concerned. And the other indicator that we have is share of domestic value added in gross manufacturing exports which has fallen from 81% to 72% between 2000 and 2005. This is when we say gross domestic is following, falling and gross foreign is increasing. What you are importing from other countries as part of your manufactured exports is increasing. That is your participation or China's participation in value chains was increasing between 2000 and 2005. And this is following the World Trade Organization participation accession as far as China is concerned. And this then falls from 76% to, eight, sorry, this rose from 76% to 82% in the following period. Meaning that increasingly, China is providing value addition from within for its own manufactured exports. A greater consolidation, a shortening of the length of value chains as we say, increasing amount of production that happens within the own economy. And therefore, the reduced need to trade and hence what we see in terms of this factor also contributing to a reduced element in terms of rate of growth of trade in the post-2012 period. What we have as a third component of the evolving trade architecture in terms of uh, globally as well as Asia is what, what we have in terms of the preferential trading agreements. In, in, in the normal or in an ideal scenario, what we see is that multilateralism, what happens as was earlier indicated at the multilateral body, trade as regulated, as promoted by the World Trade Organization, free and fair trade, more trade that's freer, but more trade that's also fairer, that happens through the World Trade Organization or the multilateral body. 
And as far as the global value chains are concerned, multilateralism in terms of greater country participation is probably the first best for smooth operation of the global value chains. The barriers between direct trade partners and between countries that are upstream to which those that provide an individual country with intermediate goods, as well as barriers that may exist with countries downstream, countries to which this particular country may provide intermediate goods as inputs into their exports, are all better addressed if all countries come together. Direct trade partners, as well as third countries, where third countries may be the individual countries upstream or downstream trading partners. All linkages, therefore, would be smoothened in terms of trade barrier discussion if this was done with all countries participating together, which obviously would be best reflected or best happen in a multilateral body, which would be the ideal case would be the WTO. Network and scale effects, as we say, in case of global value chains, they are enhanced. The implementation of these would be enhanced. The success of disciplines, as we see particular disciplines that would be catered to by the WTO, whether that be in terms of tariff barriers or that be in terms of non-tariff barriers, standards, SPS, TBT, whichever aspect we consider, consider would get better implementation if countries, more and more countries, participate together and were to open their economies simultaneously for each other. That would lead to an easier movement of goods across borders. However, as was stated by the chair earlier, we've seen the WTO over the last few years <laughs> Coming to, an, coming to a state where we've seen it, an, it in suspension. We see little in terms of progress uh, of what was started many years ago, two decades ago almost, that we had the Doha Development Agenda. Things have not moved forward in terms of the WTO being able to take that particular round forward. Beyond that, the WTO itself is under threat today, given the kind of actions that we see from the US economy in terms of delaying the appointment in the appellate body. What, therefore, do we have as an alternative as far as the smooth operation of global value chains is concerned is what has evolved in this period in terms of preferential trading agreements. That is, these trade agreements have contributed. What we see is that outside the purely unilateral opening, opening that individual, uh, the market opening that individual countries undertake on their own. Beyond that, almost all of the market opening, trade expansion, trade openness has occurred at the regional level in the past two decades. And as of 2017, we see about half of the world trade that is covered by some or the other preferential trading agreement across the world. And between 2000 and 2017, the cumulative number of regional trading agreements that we see across the world have grown from 79 to 287, with East Asia as one of the three poles for these PTA concentration, that is concentration of preferential trading agreements, the other two being Europe and North America. This has, East Asia in itself has 83 RTAs in force, the regional trading agreements, uh, in other words, the preferential trading agreements on a regional basis, and this is second only to the European Union, which has 97 RTAs for itself. What we see as far as GV, uh, the global value chains are concerned, that this second best option of the preferential trading agreements works equally well, uh, or if not as well as the WTO, works pretty well for the global value chains. The greater the number of countries that come to participate in the global, in the multilateral, or sorry, in the preferential trading agreements, greater would be the ease of flow of information and goods across for the global value chains. There is a dual causality, as we say, as we uh, see in, in, in as far as the value chains and the preferential trading agreements are concerned, in the sense that preferential trading agreements lower trade costs because more and more countries would come together and offer each other preferential access to each other's markets. Common, common cross-border disciplines would be drawn among these economies in terms of standards and uh, other non-tariff barriers as far as trade is concerned. All this would make it easier for multiple border crossings, which is inherent or which is, the base, which is basic to global value chains. Greater GVC trade, on the other hand, that is greater the trade that is happening under global value chains, greater would be or greater would be the requirement in terms of a deeper 
trade agreement. That is, the greater the amount of split that happens as far as production processes are concerned, greater would be the need on the part of the producing firms to have easier standards across borders among, as I said earlier, direct trade partners as well as indirect trade partners participating in the value chain. All of this therefore establishes a, a dual causality between global value chains and preferential trading agree agreements Greater the, number of pref uh, greater the number of members in a preferential trading agreement, and the deeper the preferential trading agreement, the more facilitative it would be of the global value chain operation. If we look at Asia in particular, we, are, we look at two main mega regional trade agreements that are, in that are in discussion or that are in operation. One is the CPTPP, what we call as the Comprehensive and Progressive uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which originally started as the Trans-Pacific Partnership with 12 members, that is with the United States. Minus the United States, it has 11 members, and this has come into effect on the 1st of January this year. The members, I list the members here. The members that are colored in green are indicative of how, uh, or what we see in or the countries that have actually, uh, countries where the CPTPP is at the moment, or came into effect on the 1st of January 2019, the other countries have yet to ratify the trade agreement in their respective um, countries. Oh, you can't see this? Singapore, New Zealand, Australia, Vietnam, Canada, Mexico, Japan. Six countries that started on the 1st of January. Vietnam, the seventh member, has ratified the, uh, it ratified the agreement earlier, but they have a process of, uh, I think it's about 90 days or 60 days, when it actually, the time that it takes to be effective. So uh, these are the seven countries in which the comprehensive and progressive TPP, which is uh, TPP minus 11, what started off as a trans-Pacific partnership between countries across the world, a large number of countries being drawn from the Asian region. That has come into effect on the 1st of January 2019. The, the uh, first summit meeting as far as this particular uh, CPTPP is concerned was held on the 19th of January, where the members have expressed the interest in keeping the, um, keeping the agreement open. Keeping the agreement open to the interested members, that is those members who would like to join later, or would like to join at any particular point of time are welcome to join provided they adhere to the standards and disciplines as have been outlined or the provisions as have been given in the origin in the CPTPP. Uh, the countries that have so far expressed interest for joining the CPTPP include Korea, Thailand, Taiwan, Colombia and the post-Brexit UK. The provisions uh, that are included in this already in effect mega regional trade agreement in Asia include what we call as core provisions as well as core extra provisions. Core and core extra provisions are provisions that go beyond just the simple ease of, uh, simple, simple task of reducing tariff barriers for goods trade across borders. They go beyond that in the sense of inclusion of many non-tariff barriers, many standards, and as we see in case of CPTPP, way beyond what is ordinarily included in the trade agreements. They include labor standards, environmental standards. Uh, these are binding commitments from individual countries, fair competition between the state-owned enterprises and private enterprise, SME export push, intellectual prop, uh, property to promote innovation with flexibilities granted for the generic pharmaceuticals and digital economy. There are other provisions as well. Some of these provisions, or these provisions are provisions that were there in the original TPP when the United States was part of it, and they continue, or they have been continued even in the CPTPP, that is the reduced uh, number of members version of the original Trans-Pacific Partnership. Basically to say that this is a comprehensive trans-Pacific or comprehensive preferential trading agreement which has 11 members, which is already in effect in Asia, and there are other members from Asia that have expressed interest to join this agreement. The other agreement that we have is the RCEP, that is the Regional Comprehensive and Economic Partnership, which is basically the ASEAN 10 countries and six plus six, which is Australia, New Zealand, uh, China, Japan, Korea, 
and India. Uh, these economies are at present or they continue to negotiate the RCEP. The RCEP is still under negotiation. The negotiations having started in 2012. Seven years hence, we are still in the process of negotiating only a part of the total agreement. As the name says, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership was also supposed to be comprehensive in terms of discussions or negotiations and agreement on three parts, that is goods, services, and investment. However, so far, only negotiations on goods have been undertaken, and they have proceeded to a certain extent. I say to a certain extent because we've yet to find agreement among all members, even as far as goods trade liberalization under the RCEP is concerned. We are hoping that this will come to a conclusion in 2019. Why is this important? It's important to see that as far as RCEP is concerned, the RCEP has both India and China as members, neither of which is a member in terms uh, of the CPTPP membership. Both these are important in the sense that these are two mega regional trade agreements in Asia. Asia has been the focus of the global value chains. Global value chains continue in Asia. They continue to be, and they, they are now more and more consolidated within. That is, there is a greater domestic, thank you, there is a greater domestic component as far as the value chains in East Asia are concerned, goods as well as otherwise. These, therefore, would be facilitative of what we see as global value chains underlying international trade, regional trade. Participation in these would benefit the countries in terms of facilitating their participation and efficient uh, working or efficient production of commodities, as well as what we see in terms of new age technology intensive um, output. There is a third agreement that's also in, uh, you know, that's been talked about, which is the free trade area of the Asia Pacific, which was first proposed, that is long time back, but more recently, a roadmap for it was proposed by China in the AEC summit, that, the, that is the ASEAN Economic Summit in 20, uh, sorry, this is not the ASEAN Economic Summit, but the APEC Summit in 2014. And more recently, it's also presented a strategic study in study report in 2016. This is an, in, an initiative in which China is interested, contrary to what many of us have come to believe that RCEP is China pushed. RCEP is basically an ASEAN-centric PTA, or preferential trading agreement. Now, as far as these three are concerned, what we see is... I can't move it. Because of time. No, I have to. Sorry, I have it here. This, this is the last, uh, last, and this, uh, you know, about to finish. Uh, what we see is, you know, that for India in particular, the GVC participation has been very low. As I said, the backward linkages with ASEAN have been 20 to 30 percent, and forward linkages are absolutely insignificant. ASEAN has its forward linkages with the rest of the world, more with the Asia-Pacific countries outside or beyond India. India's export concentration, if you take a eyeballing, you know, of the data that you have as far as export data is concerned, you will see concentrated in clothing, apparel, and footwear. Most of these goods being standard labor-intensive goods. Machinery and transport, which we've seen to be the dynamic sectors, predominant manufacturing trade sectors, in our case, 17% in, they contribute only 17% in total merchandise exports, as against 59% in China. And even as far as apparel exports are concerned, where we've seen it to be a low dynamic sector, as far as global value chain evolution around the world is concerned, India's share has remained largely constant at about 5.3% over the period when the trade flows were rising, 2002 to 2012. In 2017, when, when I was looking at the data this morning, it's reduced to 4% against China's 37%, which is the highest. And in this period, we've seen Bangladesh to have gained in this particular sector, which is from 4.5% to 8.1%. What, therefore, do we have as far as India is concerned in terms of solutions to push forward its exports is that PTA participation may provide India the possibilities of entry into global value chains as well as regional value chains. We may be able to take advantage of the facilitation that may be provided by RCEP 
CPTPP member economies that overlap with the RCEP. I give you here the overlapping economies. The blue are the ones that have expressed interest. Green are the ones that are already have CPTPP to be effective. And what we see is that as China is moving up the value chain in terms of greater technological intensity, greater domestic consolidation, we will have some of the lower end segments of the labor intensive manufactured goods value chains moving elsewhere, as well as labor intensive or probably low skilled, medium skilled uh, labor intensity value chains moving to other countries. What has been seen in recent years is the move towards Vietnam, less towards India. India continues to be very low in terms of its participation, but that's what participation in a PTA can engender for India. Also, the CPTPP offered advantages because of the overlap of membership can ultimately be, uh, bene India can benefit from that if at all India chooses to participate in uh, these mega regional trade agreements. I'll stop here and happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Patra. That was uh, quite a tour de force. And uh, uh, I must say, I didn't realize uh, international trade had become quite so complicated from when I studied it 40 years ago. So. Uh, this was a great learning experience for me, as I expect it was for some of you. Um, but I, what I worry about is, and this is, if I'm before asking for a few questions from the audience, if I can ask, use my chairperson's prerogative to ask one or two questions. First, do you have a sense that uh, our trade, trade negotiators and so on, post Ambassador Bhatia, uh, are aware of this whole importance of both the global value chains to our trade possibilities, as well as the role of regional PTAs linked through or encouraging of global value chains for our trade. I sometimes, because I don't see this in the discussion in the pink papers or anything like that. So that's sort of one question. And the, the, the other is, I have the feeling that in the last two years, regrettably, our uh, trade policy has moved backwards because we've got into the habit of imposing customs tariffs uh, under the guise of uh, make in India, which is not necessarily the best way to make in India. Um, indeed, it is not. Uh, both, I mean, this was typified, I think, in the budget of last year, that is the 2018 February budget, when across a very wide range of commodities, uh, customs tariffs were increased. So even at the simple level of what you call basic trade, we seem to be going backwards. So uh, is this something that we should be really doing or should we go a different way? Do I take a few more? Or? Just take a couple and then I'll take okay. mine and then move on. I'll, I'll meanwhile okay. note down where the questions are coming. Okay, the first, you know, when you talk about Indian negotiators, we have one of the negotiators sitting here you know, uh, but I would like to say uh, that as far as our Indian negotiators are concerned, from what one hears, they're guided more by the uh, industry interest rather than by what would be appropriate in terms of, you know, what's happening around the world in as far as trade is concerned. Uh, the economic viewpoint or the underlying economic logic of trade is probably understood, but understood to a limited extent. Uh, a lot of it, that is the negoci negotiations and the movement forward is undertaken uh, in consultation with stakeholders, which is largely constituting of industry participation. Industry, as far as India is concerned, has been hugely uh, reserved in its desire for opening up. I think constant protectionist policies is what they ask for. And increasingly, that's probably been the uh, route that the government of India has taken. We continue to be shy of opening up and participating in preferential trading agreements. We do not see trading agreements to be giving us an advantage in terms of uh, uh, increasing our ability to participate in value chains. We instead see it as merely a threat in terms of more and more goods coming up, opening up in terms of access to, provision of access to our market, you know. Rather than, uh, you know, in terms of us becoming more and more competitive as we expose ourselves to greater competition. 
invariably the argument that I have come across is what is going to happen to our smaller and medium uh, scale industries, you know. If you look around, you know, many of the East Asian countries, in particular, for example, Malaysia, we should see the kind of policies that they have adopted or developed in particular for these MSMEs or small and medium sector uh, enterprises in order to push them both to participate or to act as ancillary industries for the larger corporations that would be participating in the, that would become as part of the value chains. So our, uh, you know, viewpoint is very often guided by what may be more populist sentiment, what probably uh, holds a greater sway in terms of those who count for the, um, for the ruling class, both in terms of industry as well as the smaller enterprises. Uh, as far as customs tariffs is concerned, increasing con customs tariffs that we've seen, increasing customs duty certainly does not make for um, make in India. I have been saying this constantly, both as when I write or when I talk at any of the forums, that as far as India is concerned, we need to open up more, we need to participate in global value chains, higher protectionist measures are not going to enhance or help enhance Indian industry's productivity. So we really need to cut down, we really need to open up, we really need to expose our industry to greater competition, which can happen only if we actively see the PTAs to, PTAs as means to participation in value chain and trade enhancement. And we also see the advantages of trade as such, you know, because we continue to feel, you know, that a lot of consumption can be generated from within the country. A lot of our uh, purchasing power exists within the country and therefore we don't really need to look at countries or markets abroad, which is not really true because the greater you expose yourself, the greater you expose yourself to competition and the greater would be the extent of specialization and increased efficiency that would be possible for industry. Thank you. Now that, uh, I think actually the gentleman at the back used to ask, raised your hand first, please. If you can just mention who you are or organization. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Shantan. So, uh, two questions. One is, are you aware of any assessments of the economic uh, impact of uh, CPTPP in terms of its contribution to trade growth and GDP growth? And what I'd be interested to know is to what extent those benefits, to the extent they are net benefits, are coming from reduced trade barriers as opposed to the various uh, rules and provisions you mentioned in areas like competition policy and intellectual property. Um, I mean, would it be, I mean, there's been a big lowering of trade barriers in terms of tariffs generally worldwide, so I'm interested to know where the, the net benefit from these types of agreements down in the region are going to come from. And will India lose out by not being a member? Should, I mean, clearly, as you said, the RCEP negotiations are ongoing. Should India consider joining uh, CPTPP in the meantime, is it likely to lose out? I don't know whether there's going to be, there's clearly large overlap between the scope, the geographic scope of the two agreements, which also raises the question of harmonization of, of rules and provisions to the extent that that's going to happen. Um, and just if I may be permitted one more question, they, I mean, these large uh, multi-country agreements are clearly quite complicated. As you said RCEP has been on the negotiation for seven years. Should India instead be looking at uh, focusing more on uh, lowering barriers with its immediate neighbors? I think BIMSTEC is one example where, um, which is a more proximate to India's neighborhood. Should it be looking more at kind of uh, bilateral or uh, agreements with its, with its immediate neighbors? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, gentleman in blue. Yes, good evening. Good evening, my name, my name is Sartak Vitsena. So uh, I wanted to ask that uh, often the reluctance to adopt multilateral agreements stems from the uh, fact that it comes with other set of conditions like uh, uh, intellectual property regime, the environmental protection regime, or the labor standards that should exist within the members. Like for example, India had huge reservations when it was negotiating the bilateral trade and investment agreement to EU the, because th that the European standards they would uh, you know, apply to India. So how how genuine or how uh, 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 are these reservations genuine in the sense that we actually stand to lose out vis-a-vis -vis our trading partners if we adopt those regimes because we are actually not prepared 
or are these fears more or less unfounded and it, we will evolve over the period of time once we once we enter into agreements with such agreements? Thank you. Uh, there two one there and I think one was over at the back. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Sanjeev Srivastava. I'm a researcher uh, and I'm currently teaching at Delhi University. Uh, my two questions. Uh, first one is uh, about uh, the current uh, recent U.S. decision to uh, keep uh, India out of the generalized system of preferences that uh, uh, <coughs> the, the facility which they had given to us. So, uh, and saying that India is not giving us uh, a reasonable and equitable market access and uh, that's why we are uh, deciding to keep you out from this list. And similar, uh, uh, and for the same decision, they have given a similar, a different argument for the Turkey. So uh, what do you think, how should we negotiate uh, uh, with the United States on this matter? And how should our interlocutors, our negotiators should deal with the US authorities on this matter? Because there are 60 days time period b before that it cannot be uh, implemented. So that's my first question. And the second one is about the comprehensive uh, TPP, the new TPP. So how far, how likely it would be a success without the United States presence there? What do you think? What is the feasibility of its success? Thank you. Over there at the back, I think you had a question. Uh, good evening, Professor. Uh, so my question, uh, my name is Mohammad Zaki and I'm a student. Uh, my question is that uh, recently the government uh, cancelled the most favored nation status given to Pakistan. So uh, do you think there will be a significant impact of on the Indian economy because of this move of the government? Okay, I think uh, so that you can manage, let's well, do uh, these four. Yeah, um, I think most of them relate to CPTPP um, and the provisions in CPTPP. Um, in terms of an assessment undertaken to um, gauge the benefits as far as CPTPP is concerned. Many studies, but not with respect to India. That's one. Two, uh, you know, with respect to barriers, trade barriers, if you mean tariff barriers, they're already very low. So the advantage as far as tariff barriers is concerned, one would not consider. The other bit is, you know, that these newer age preferential trading agreements, you know, with the kind of provisions that we see, are basically being designed so as to facilitate the global value chains of the new age. They are not there to facilitate the earlier age commodity movement or intermediate goods movement. So they are you know, facilitative of the new age value chains. As far as India is concerned, India's participation in CPTPP, I, my personal belief is, you see, that for India, the RCEP would be a stepping stone to CPTPP, if at all India can graduate to that stage. Because CPTPP is of a much higher standard in terms of the kind of provisions that it has included. As was stated by the other uh, you know, per, uh, person who's asked the question, we've had many of the problems that, uh, with respect to the provisions that are included in CPTPP in case of our bilateral agreements. India, EU, labor standards have been big you know, on that. Dairy products that are being talked today in terms of the GSP preferences have been a question mark in terms of the India, EU trade agreement. So many aspects that are being included in CPTPP, India is not yet at that level. But if we are able to graduate on to RCEP, you know, or if you are able to conclude RCEP, take advantage of the RCEP, we could be participating in at least some form in the value chains, which could ultimately be north-south value chains, because many of the members are overlapping members of RCEP and CPTPP. If you are able to make an entry at this stage through at some stage of these north-south value chains, there is a possibility that India can graduate to higher levels. But a direct entry into CPTPP, I don't think India is capable or India is even thinking about that. We yet fight shy of even um, entering or participating in the RCEP, you know, beyond the goods trade liberalization. On the, one second, on the BIMSTEC bit, you see, as far as uh, BIMSTEC FTA is uh, off the, uh, the grouping completely. I don't think they're even thinking about an FTA now. Uh, m uh, my own original, uh, my own assessment of the original, originally designed FTA under the BIMSTEC was that it was a perfect FTA. It was on the lines of what we saw as far as, uh, you know, some of the best FTAs around the world have been done in terms of its comprehensive coverage, deadline specification. But none of that has been followed. Many of the countries are not interested. Many of the countries are on to other kinds of agreements that are probably more useful, probably more, uh, you know, working. 
uh, whether that be in terms of CPTPP or RCEP. You know, those are the ones that are attracting many member countries, even as far as BIMSTEC is concerned. BIMSTEC leaves a lot to be desired in terms of a regional grouping. Uh, success of CPTPP without the United States, it's already, I think, successful in the fact that it's taken off without the United States, so uh, that's good enough, I think as a starting point. And probably, as I said, you know, these are member countries that are interested in these provisions because they are participating in value chains where they see these provisions to facilitate what they have an advantage in. So they'll make sure probably even to take, the, take it forward without the United States, or maybe we'll have the United States joining at some point. Uh, the GSP, well, uh, uh, India's made it out to be not impacting our trade. Uh, but I think that as far as the you know, uh, we make it out to be not impacting India in the sense that there could be other markets for India. But as we see, uh, you know, in, in the commodities that we are exporting, uh, the competition, we may not be ready for that kind of competition in other markets at the kind of tariffs that may prevail in those countries, you know. So to be able to say that we'll be able to cover uh, the, the loss of trade that's happening on account of GSP withdrawal by the United States, I have my doubts about that, you know. How to negotiate, I think, uh, we should, uh, my, my belief is that we should be, you know, not doing this bit of increasing our duties, which is probably a more basic reason for the United States to withdraw the GSP than the more obvious reason that they have cited in this context. Uh, MFN uh, is not gonna make, make a difference to either. It's a good signaling device uh, as one part of what we call in trade theory as trade sanctions. The origin, I mean, the initial bit is done through, uh, you know, you signal your displeasure, official displeasure, stern displeasure, you know, in terms of a country going out of line on a certain issue. But the fact that it will make an impact on either of the economies, no. Good evening. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the presentation. I am Mayank. I'm working under ma'am. I'm a PhD student. Ma'am, you mentioned that uh, China is transitioning from export-driven to export-driven and invest investment economy to consumption and service-driven economy. Now, if I take consumption into consideration, uh, uh, China's uh, domestic consumption, as far as its comparative advantage in uh, industrial uh, in infrastructural and transport develop, uh, construction is concerned it has a, a sort of comparative advantage and given the fact that uh, china's domestic market is suffering uh, a sort of saturation they are looking uh, for markets abroad and that can, uh, that could be understood with reference to its very ambitious project uh, called belt and road in initiative now, second thing you said that it is transitioning to service-driven economy. If we look uh, into China's ambitious plan of Made in China 2025 vision, uh, they are focusing more on high-tech, high-tech, uh, high-technologically uh, goods, which includes uh, semiconductors. Because given the fiasco which happened between U.S. and China, uh, like last year, China imported around 300 billion dollars of semiconductors from U.S. So uh, given that fact, uh, given that aspect uh, into consideration, I think that uh, China is still uh, is, is focusing in manufacturing rather than services. Now, as far as export-driven and investment is concerned, uh, uh, can I say that the Belt and Road Initiative, which according to Rand Corporation estimates around $1 trillion to $8 trillion, uh, it, it, can China be uh, regarded still as an export-driven and investment economy, whereby it is uh, hunting markets abroad now, given its saturation in domestic markets? Thank you. And, uh, oh, oh, no, the lady behind me. Yeah. Um, my question is that... Uh, name an organization. <laughs> to what extent India... Name an organization. Oh. Uh, my name is Manjita Singh. And uh, uh, my question is, to what extent will India be impacted by not joining RCEP, given that we already have FTAs with uh, ASEAN and Japan and Korea, and we are negotiating with uh, New Zealand and uh, Australia. The only country that's missing is China, and most of the industries in India are basically scared of China, not the other. other that's the saddest part. No? Uh, 
to what extent we are going to be impacted and if we don't join? Let me start with the... Uh, I think there's oh. one last question. Okay. Take from here. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Thanks for the insights, valuable insights. I'm Praveen, I'm the Minister of Defense. Uh, maybe it's my ignorant question, but the thing is, how effective are the implementation of WIPO and this PCT in the intellectual property? Because we see the East Asian Giants products, they have traded all over. Before the original product comes, probably I think they come with the products uh, which are obviously more uh, intruded into the society, m uh, into the consumer, which usually they buy them only. So how effective are these intellectual property rights, uh, the objectives which are of WIPO and uh, PCT and IPS and so How effective are they in implementation? I think that, I think that, that will be the, that's the last one. Sorry? Okay, we'll make that the last one. You're far away. I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm M.B. Chandar from Delhi University. From and the question is, Delhi University. our economy is projected to be, currently it is 2.5 trillion dollar US dollars as the government projects. It is projected to be 5 trillions in the next five years. As you have sh shown that East, East uh, Asian economy is slowing down, China put in particular. How much this predictions, projection can be achieved or it can, is a false, new, uh, false statistics you can see. Okay, okay. okay. I, I think I'm gonna pick and choose. I'm not gonna talk about BRI because that's a huge topic separate uh, where we can have a separate discussion, lecture or something, nor am I an expert on intellectual property, WIPO. Uh, so I'm not going to get into these, but I'll answer the question on, uh, you know, what if we don't enter uh, our SEP because we have bilaterals. You know, we need to understand the difference between bilaterals and mega regionals. The, f the fact that I kind of presented only mega regionals and when I say that there is a duality or dual causality between GVC and PTAs, the larger the number of members in a PTA, the greater the facilitation of GVC operation. The only way that you will enter into a global value chain or a regional value chain would be if you are negotiating and participating in an agreement which has multiple members. Because those multiple members, you know, there's economies of scale that happen as far as implementation of disciplines is concerned. You have common disciplines, you will implement together, you will decide on opening up together. So you will then be working together as part of one value chain. That is if you are a part of value chain to begin with. So you have, you know, that's the only way of entering into these value chains. That's one. The other thing, you know, where, where you say that we have bilaterals with all except with China, um, you know, my, f my re not reading, but I, I would like, you know, in the sense one, one can probably see that as far as China is concerned, with this ongoing US-China trade war and trade tensions, the tariffs is a front to what they are probably wanting China to do on their, technology, IP, et cetera, issues. And those issues will probably be accepted by China to a certain extent, as is being made out to be that a deal is being done between these two. And increasingly, we will see China probably moving towards greater liberalization of the sectors that are presently constrained within, whether that be in terms of intellectual property, whether that be in terms of uh, SOEs, they are all you know, going to be somehow maneuvered by the United States or China is going to be maneuvered into complying to a very large extent or to at least some extent by the United States, the way it's going now. I mean, if they don't increase, increase of tariffs is hugely harmful as far as China is concerned if it continues in the longer run and to 25% and over. So they'll probably have other provisions or other aspects of bilateral trade that the United States sees as as contributing to the China, uh, made in China 2025, you know. They want to probably break that bit, you know. So if they bring around China, which they'll probably attempt at, China, I feel, is going to get increasingly, uh, you know, conditioned to probably, conditioned to joining CPTPP, more like that, or proceed with its own FTAP. That is the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. Because China is ultimately interested in value chain furthering value chain trade. It's not going to restrict itself to looking for markets, smaller markets here, there, and everywhere. It's got the BRI in place to do that, you know. 
So there is other things that are happening in terms of its technological advancement, in terms of its made in, made in China, uh, for which it's it's trying to have this kind of a bilateral with the United States that will take its idea forward, you know, at the same time not impede its trade as it's going on. So, you know, we will not have that kind of a China-India bilateral that is really significant. China is way ahead. China is in a different sphere. They are thinking about things or manufacturing in a very different context, you see. And that manufacturing is technology intensive, is R&D intensive, is knowledge intensive. It's not intermediate goods intensive anymore. That's moving out. That's where we should find our place. So, you know, the entire context, I think, needs to be looked at in a more holistic manner, even by India, than just looking at it, oh God, this is China, we are going to be flooded by Chinese goods, and so we must not enter into any of the PTAs. Well, I think uh, we could go on, and I think uh, it's a very rich subject, it's speaking for myself, and I think, some, some of you, it's been a real education. I think it's been an education in two or three fronts. First the vital importance of global value chains over the last 15 years particularly in world trade and how that has evolved, especially in Asia. And the, the sort of dual causality, as Professor Batra said, between global value chains and uh, multi-party uh, regional trade agreements, which is again a theme where I found it extremely um, knowledge enhancing for myself. And my fear is that uh, in both these areas, we are not doing that well in India, is my understanding. Uh, and nor do we have sufficient understanding. I think we still think in terms of the old-fashioned uh, uh, trade systems uh, focused on tariffs, focused on just cro goods crossing, not, not realizing the importance of knowledge, not realizing the importance of intermediate goods and uh, these dimensions. So I think it, for all these counts, Professor Batra, I uh, must thank you on behalf of all of us for uh, at least lifting the curtain a little, little bit. And we may not have understood everything you have said, but at least it has opened up uh, new areas for us to understand, study, and follow. Uh, and it's a very difficult area uh, compared to perhaps uh, the more simpler world that uh, old international trade textbooks covered. So thank you again, and thank all of you for taking the trouble to come. And I appreciate all of you staying through what is a really a high powered academic lecture for uh, an hour and uh, uh, 40 minutes, um, or hour and 20 minutes. And uh, once again, let us show our appreciation to this. Thank you, thank you so much.